My name is Hector Del Castillo, I'm Chief Product Officer of Bold PM. And as Chris mentioned, today's topic is achieving smarter product outcomes in the age of disruption. And I'd like to welcome all of you to today's discussion. Special thanks to AIPMM for inviting me to talk about this particular topic. Also thanks to Podcast Village because I'm actually recording the audio piece so that I can actually uh, have a podcast that uh, I will be publishing later and share with anyone that is interested in listening to this and reviewing the material that we'll be discussing today. And also special thanks to Digital Pen for doing such a great job in social media marketing and being able to uh, raise the buzz about today's topic. 70% or more of new products fail within three years from introduction. And furthermore, 50 U.S. retailers filed for bankruptcy in 2017. Is this a sign of the times? Disruption is everywhere. It is a reality. It is today's reality for many companies across industries, and you need to figure out what to do about disruption. Today's discussion will be this answering this question. Why ensure your offering is resilient to disruption? And what can you do as a product leader or as a product executive or director to ensure that you're enabling your product teams to deal with disruption? So what we'll be covering today is why product management must change and what does it mean when disruption is everywhere what does it mean to your product and what does it mean to your business? And we're going to talk about steps that you can take to ensure your portfolio is resilient to disruption. And then we'll be summarizing key takeaways. And then, of course, we'll have a Q&A. Why product management must change? Well, I mentioned earlier that there's a high failure rate of products. And so you're wondering, well, if many of these companies do have product managers and product marketing managers, why is there so much product failure? And what does it mean? Well, the reality today is that in, in the middle of the digital era, buyer behavior has changed. Today's customers are not looking or interested in standalone products. They want complete solutions. They want speed, they want value, and they want it now. And they expect a frictionless end-to-end -end experience that is what they expect according to their expectations. And so they want to be able to quickly and intuitively use a product or a solution to get what they need, when they need it, and they want it now. So as a vendor, how do you deal with this type of behavior? It may not be so easy, especially if you have a solution or an offering that has quite a bit of complexity and all often not just one segment, but multiple customer segments that are all buying because they have similar needs. Really, if you look at why most products fail and why there's such a high failure rate, it is really a combination of any of these because what it really means is that you really have one or more of these that are impacting your offering. It really means that often when products are launched into market, they never reach profitability. And this is what product failure means. When, you, when we talk about product failure, it means that Products are launched, and even though your business case said, well, I'm going to be have this many units sold in the first three to five years, and I'm going to have a break-even period, you're nowhere close to those expectations by the time you launch when you have any combination of these issues when you go to market, when your product goes to market. And it really does, doesn't mean that the product doesn't work because they do work according to design. It was just that often most vendors don't do the homework to actually figure out what actually customers are looking for and may understand the need but not necessarily be honing in on what is the preferred solution and what are they what do the customers consider value the high failure rate really means that most companies today and whether they're incumbents or they're brand new companies it is really hard and everybody's struggling to achieve a steady flow of successful products and it's a daunting cha challenge for most organizations. And the result is that most everyone, most companies will put out product after product after product, 
and eventually they'll have to be pulled from the market because those products never become profitable. And so there's a lot of incumbents and those incumbents that are out there, you're saying, well, is it really true for these companies? Well, if you really look behind what's, you know, where the core revenue is coming for these companies, it really comes from maybe a handful of products when they have a very large product portfolio. And what it really means is that they have a lot of dogs, a lot of prob problem childs or question mark products that are really not profitable. And often their core revenue is coming from just a handful of products. So it's an ongoing issue for organizations. So what is happening? Because many of these incumbents do have product managers and product marketing managers, and they've been around for some time and they do training. So what are some of the things that are not going on when you have comprehensive teams of product managers and product marketing managers? Here we talk about seven reasons as to why product management and why I'm saying that product management and product marketing roles must be restructured. And we're gonna count down from seven all the way to one. Number seven, most product managers today don't work with collaborators. It really means that most everyone is working on designing or building or testing and making sure that they're packaging the product not really concerned with outside organizations or coordinating with suppliers, with key partners that often are needed to figure out how to quickly scale when you need to ramp up production, as well as reduce your cost of operations when you once you go to market. And the result is that sometimes your operational costs are too prohibitive, prohibitive and if you do get traction in the marketplace, you're still not gonna get profitability because you might have cash flow just not very much margin or revenue or profit from your product. So not working with collaborators is an issue for most product managers. Number six, don't perform por portfolio or trade-off analysis. And what I mean by that is that most product managers, as I talk to them, are just way too tactical. They don't get involved in the strategic side of things and often don't get, even get involved in doing product portfolio analysis of the entire product portfolio and don't look at what do they need to do and how to position or reposition an offering when they know that their competitors are eroding market share. And with disruptors, that means additional competition and you need to work harder at really enunciating your unique value proposition in the marketplace. Number five, don't determine a product's business model. Often I find that most product managers are way too deep in the weeds working with developers, with engineering, with testing, and often doing a lot of the grunt work for marketing and sales, not really looking at how do you price it and doing the competitive analysis and then looking at the value proposition from the customer's point of view. And that can be an issue, especially when you're working on a product that you're about to launch. Much of this work, can take place even as the product is being conceived or even as the product is beginning at the front end of design. Number four, don't manage products across a full life cycle. Often I find that most product managers are working on just designing, development, testing, and then they will start all over again, working on the next improvement to a product or a product line. And often they don't really concern with hey, do we need to have any new products that we don't have today just to strengthen our offering and have a unique value proposition in the marketplace? For these products that are just not selling, how do we gracefully retire them from the marketplace in order to continue uh, getting the attention from the customer segments that we're selling into? Number three, they're, usually we're rewarded on the wrong success metrics. And what I mean by that is that most often, we're rewarded for delivering products on time and within budget. But often, maybe we need to take a little bit more time to make sure that we add the right things before we go to market once we find out that something is missing from the customer's point of view and that we need to do additional things just to make sure that we have a unique value proposition over our competitors. And often, these are discussions that most product managers just don't have because they're tasked to just get it done, get it out, and then pass it on to marketing and sales not always the best approach. Number two, we're encouraged to think small. 
And what I mean by that is that we're assigned to one product or one product feature, and that's all we do. And often we don't even work with other product managers that are working on other features or that are working on understanding how to create a full offering across products that are within the same company. And often these are the things that we need to figure out how to undo. And then number one, we're just not perceived as effective leaders. And if you don't believe any of these reasons that I just went, went over, just take a look at my previous webcast from a month ago. And I talk about this information that came out from a survey that was done about three years ago. And there's plenty of literature out there of information that reinforces what everybody's saying. As a matter of fact, this whole idea for this webcast came out from this one article that I read about a couple of months ago that Bain published. And they're basically arguing that product management is just not working today. And they're actually recommending to their customers, the Fortune 1000 customers around the world that they work with, to implement a new role called Offering Manager. And if you look at the description of what an Offering Manager does, it's exactly what I learned when I first worked and started working at Lucent Technologies, formerly part of AT&T, when they had this role implemented the right way within those companies. And even today, if you look at what AT&T has done, they have done a great, great work at reinventing themselves, transforming their value proposition and transforming their business in order to keep up with disruptors. disruptors. I don't agree with that article that Bain published. I don't think we need to have an offering manager. I think we need to restructure product management and also restructure product marketing. Both roles must be restructured to deal with these deficiencies that are within organizations. And the bottom line is that it's really not the fault necessarily of the product managers or the product marketing managers. I really think it's really the the leaders within the companies, the executives that are responsible for making sure that they have allocated the right people and grown the right people with the right skills and be able to have the right level of processes assigned to products in order to create business growth. And it starts from there. Restructuring the role means that executives and business leaders must get involved and they must get buy-in in order to actually restructure the role the right way. One example of a company that really has struggled and has been in the news quite a bit because they've been losing shareholder value for the last few years, and that is GE. And GE used to be the poster child that all the B schools highlighted back in the days when Jack Welch was at the helm. It actually was a great company and it became a global conglomerate that basically using lots of product managers and lots of marketing managers across business lines, they were making all the decisions about what to do and what not to do with the different lines of business. And the strategy when Jack Welch was at the helm was very simple. We either are number one or number, number two in any industry that we are in or that we decide to enter or we get out. And all the product managers and all the product marketing managers were tasked to follow those directives in order to run the business and also be able to analyze and make decisions about their offering, their entire product portfolio across lines of business. So what's happening today? Is it one, is it Chinese com competitors and other countries who are following the same, the, the same thing, imitating what, what GE has done at the national level? Is it digital disruptors? Is it unfavorable capital market conditions? Is it regulatory changes that are unfavorable to their industries? It, was it the Great Recession? Well, here's an answer. I actually found an article that was published earlier this month in Harvard Business Review, and it's actually from this uh, person that actually said, you know, they studied the, the model. And, and the summary of, of, the, of, of the article says that GE model was really a combination of things. It was due to global competition, meaning conglomerates that were actually funded by countries, China included, Samsung in 
Korea and Siemens in Germany and a few others as they were springing up, even uh, Tata in India, for example. This was global competition that was actually backed by countries that actually eroded some of their market share at the global level. In combination with a disruptive force, which is a technology revolution that really has spanned across all the industries that they were decided to enter at some point. And the also investor power capital has changed and now it's becoming more accessible. Low interest rates are, are available and it really destroyed the model for specifically the GE capital business unit that used to fund all the projects that GE used to used to uh, win. And then finally, it was also the spread of professional management. And the combination of all these things is basically what the author of this particular article saying has killed the GE model. And not now it's caused so, so much disruption that even other conglomerates are beginning to make take the steps to actually ensure that they can pivot the, wisely. And we'll talk about what that means. In today's environment, what does disruption mean? Gibson going out of business. And that is reality. They filed for bankruptcy earlier this year. How long has Gibson been around? How long has GE been around? And these are bigger companies. Disruption is impacting all sorts of companies, incumbents specifically, that do not figure out how to train and grow their product managers and product ma marketing managers to actually figure out how to identify disruption and how to deal with disruptors effectively. So most vendors today, the bottom line is that they just don't focus enough on understanding how buyer behavior has changed and how customers now are evaluating products differently than ever before. And they're making different purchase decisions based on different factors. And lack of knowledge means that product managers and product marketing managers are not bringing that information to their teams and they're just making assumptions. And you know what happens when you make way too many assumptions. Let's go into the next section. And the section is, what does the, the disruption really means to your product? In this section, we're gonna talk specifically as to what it means and we're gonna talk about how to actually identify disruption and how to go about mitigating the effects and ensuring your offering is resilient to disruption. And I wanna start with retail and what's happening in the retail industry, Sears and Toys R Us. These are all brands that right now are, you know, have either gone out of business or are in the process of going out of business. And there's no stopping that. As a matter of fact, I pointed earlier that last, just last year, 50 US retailers filed for bankruptcy and another portion is supposed to do so this year. And that includes Toys R Us as well as other retailers. And these are all retailers, incumbents who, for the most part, the common denominator is they never moved and they never figured out how to deal with disruption and therefore never even tasked their product managers, brand managers, product marketing managers to figure out how to effectively eliminate any risk of disruption. So let's take a look at what disruption really means. Disruption is really a process when you really, when you really consider a process that has specific steps. And usually the steps are that a smaller company will come in and have a very focused strategy, marketing strategy, and they're able to capture a niche, a customer segment that for the most part is dissatisfied by all incumbents who have something in the marketplace already. And it's a combination of many of these companies that come in and they create a new kind of competition and they actually will start capturing not only these dissatisfied customer segments that incumbents are not, aren't even looking at, but they actually will over time uh, leverage other customer segments that are buying the incumbents products. And they effectively begin to erode market share for incumbents. So what you want to do is you want to be able, if you're in an organization that is an incumbent, meaning you are a multinational company or you're already at the mid-market level or above, meaning you already have a few hundreds of millions of dollars in annual revenue because you have, come, you have been around for uh, some time and you're 
already saturated or matured in growth and in, in the offering, it means that you're likely to be disrupted by any of these companies if you just ignore them. So we're going to talk about specifically in, in this section, what are these global forces that cause disruption? And there's actually a couple of great resources that I found to identify global forces that right now there's a perfect storm, so to speak. Five global forces that are colliding and they're expected to trigger disruption that will last for the next couple of decades, literally through the year 2050. And it's disruption at the level that we have never seen in the last 60 years. So more than ever before, this is like a perfect storm that we haven't seen in over 60 years. And it's actually going to be a collision of five global forces that are going to be disrupting industries and global markets. So let's talk about what they are. Many of these came from a book that was published called No Ordinary Disruption that was written by McKenzie Partners. And then also a report that was published earlier this year by Bain called Labor 2030, where they were looking at the collision of some of these forces. Now, if you kind of compare the one, one reference that talks about four global forces, the other one talks about three global forces. Many of these are common, but one is not. And we actually have at least five global forces involved. And we're going to talk about them here. Number one, urbanization. And urbanization means that now most of us are not are basically moving away from rural areas and then we're moving into metropolitan areas. And it's not just in US, this is a global phenomenon. Look at the numbers, 440 cities in emerging markets that will account for nearly half of the global GDP by 2025. This is where the growth in revenue is. And this is basically new markets that are emerging today, 440 cities that are in emerging markets. And that equates to two and a half billion people around the world that represents those markets. And most of them are Asian cities. It's not just the growth in China. There's also other Asian countries that are growing and outpacing the growth rate of Western countries. And that is going to cause a shift in economy and a shift in the preference of what they want to buy and also the style of what they prefer when they have the same basic need. And if you're not figuring out what that is, how are you gonna to sell to that market? Number two, automation. Automation is everywhere. And already, one trillion objects are expected to connect to the internet. This is the internet of things by 2025. This is the springing of all these companies, including companies like Ring, including companies like Nest, and others that are out there already and there will be 1 trillion new devices that are all smart connected devices by 2025. And this represents somewhere in the range of three to six trillion dollar market in the next five years. And then automation, it also includes technologies like robotics, drone technologies, as well as embedding or integrating artificial intelligence to automate and add intelligence to have virtual assistance. Look at the countries with the highest density of robot workers. These are robots that are meant to displace workers. And the highest density, U.S. is lagging. And even though U.S. is above the average for most countries, which is a global average is 74, uh, robots per 10,000 employees. Look at South Korea, look at Singapore, look at Germany. The way of the future is that automation is going to take over and we need to catch up because we are behind South Korea, Singapore, Germany, Japan. So how are we going to catch up and how are we going to bring those environments, new manufacturing, new products that are robots that have artificial intelligence and able to make decisions and then also run themselves. Automation is a future $8 trillion market in the next 10 years. Number three, aging workforce. And the aging workforce means that most of us are aging and we're getting older. Well, the reality is that not all of us are gonna be able to retire by the time we get to 65. 
Many of us will have to continue to work because our cost of living is going high. Many of us today are already underemployed. Look at what Bain is saying about aging, uh, the aging population. People over 75 years old are today spending more than ever before. And if you didn't plan for this, for us living long, longer and the rise in cost of living, including healthcare expenses, you are a very vulnerable um, population if you're an aging senior today because you know that you may be running out of money because you just, you know, you were using the old rules of what you had to put away to in order to fund your retirement. And now most people are going to be running out of money and they need to figure out how to monetize. And most often employers, it's an obstacle, it's a barrier to try to hire seniors in, in today's work, uh, in today's companies. It's, it is an ongoing issue that needs to be resolved because many aging seniors are going to have to work longer and we're going to have to deal with an aging population. And this phenomenon is not just in U.S. This is a global phenomenon impacting Western industrial countries. Number four, global connections. Globalization means that there's a lot more connectivity and there's a lot of more spreading of things that can go viral very quickly just because more of us are connected across borders. Look at the flow. Tourism added $2 trillion in GDP in just you know, between 1960 all the way to 20, 2013. More and more people are traveling internationally than ever before. And even post Great Recession, the, the, the number of people that are traveling internationally has been growing. And it's all part of what's been going on for the last 15, 20 years. Globalization means more of us are working across borders and we have to be in front of customers. We have to go outside of our borders to be able to deal with customers, deal with distribution channels, selling into different markets. Number five, inequality. And inequality means that now you have wealth inequality. And here's some information about where we are. Today, financial inequality is rampant in all Western industrial countries. And a recent report says that U.S. is the worst offender, meaning that the division between the poor and the rich has gotten wider and it is worse in U.S. compared to any other country in the world. And what that means is that income and wealth inequality are on the rise across major economies. All the Western industrial countries, 28 countries were actually sampled for this particular report and the and everyone is signaling that their wealth inequality is rising. So why is that a problem? Well, look at what's happening in the U.S. U.S. household debt is at a record high. At the end of last year, it went up to $13.1 trillion. What it means is that most of us today, even though we are in a house, maybe employed, we are all underemployed and cost of living is going up higher than we're getting raises and therefore debt is piling up. And this is not a good combination because even if you look at what was happening before Great Recession, we're very likely to have another recession pretty soon here in US given this high household debt. How do we deal with that? So these are a summary, the five global forces that will trigger long-term disruption. And what I mean is disruption will last for decades and this will impact multiple industries multiple major markets and we're going to have to figure out how to still be able to sell our solutions to customer segments that are looking for solutions now that we covered that let's talk about ensuring that your product portfolio is resilient because now that you know that there are disruptive forces that you don't control once you understand that they're coming you need to figure out how to eliminate or reduce the risk of negatively impacting your offering in the marketplace. And furthermore, that it doesn't <clears throat> impact your business, that you can eat, uh, still be able to sell and outperform your competitors. So as I mentioned before, just disruption is inevitable. And here's information from Accenture. 63% of companies today are experiencing disruption and 44% of companies are highly susceptible to future disruption. 
This includes some of the forces that I spoke about earlier. So when faced with disruption, what we know is that losers that cling to, that try to cling to their legacy businesses will mostly lose. It's those companies, the ones that will win, meaning that they will still maintain market share or at least outperform competitors and disruptors. They're the ones, these are the companies that seize the moment, they seize the opportunity and then figure out what this, where are the opportunities when there's a lot of disruption. And the first thing they do is they figure out how to protect the core, <clears throat> the core revenue, when the core market segment that they're selling into and bring in new segments. So what Accenture is doing in this report that was published in February of this year is really saying that there are four different ways to really understand what disruption could do to your industry and to your business. And any of these combination of things, you can actually respond to them differently because you may have in, you may be in an, in an industry that is very volatile. You have a lot of volatility. You may be in an industry that has a lot of viability, durability, or vulnerability. What does that mean? And the same report actually says and actually studied about 20 different major industries. Each one has about 98 different smaller segments within those industries. And here's the picture that they came up with. Now, I find this is actually pretty enlightening and a visionary type of report because very similar to the way that you would do product portfolio management, which on a two by two matrix, like the BCG matrix, you divide your products into four different categories. This allows you to start viewing as a product manager, as a product marketing manager, where is your industry at and which mode is it in and what level of disruption are, are you undergoing through today versus what you're likely to see in the next few years, but at least allows you to start look, looking at all the what if scenarios and start doing the trade off analysis and doing the analysis on the implications as to what is the best weight approach to actually make sure that you continue to be to be profitable and that you continue to outperform com competitors at the same time that you're basically l ensuring that you're minimizing the impact of disruptors. And the bottom line of, about this report, it says that no matter where of these four options, your best defense is to have a bold offensive strategy. And what it means is that if you're an incumbent, you just don't wait. You actually have to fill, figure out and enable your team, and that includes product managers, product marketing managers, to ensure that you have a game plan as to how are you going to play offense, not defense. Because anybody who's going to play, play defense or doesn't do anything will lose. This is what the data is showing. So you need to start Im immediately designing offensive tactics. So we're going to talk about, based on this report from Accenture, what are these four bold offensive tactics that depending on where you are, where your industry and where your business is at with respect to this quadrants, what are the best preferred offensive tactics that you can utilize? And then we'll talk a little bit more about what they mean. We'll give you some examples and some case studies. So here are the four offensive tactics. You can, if you're in a viability, you grow the core. If you're in volatility, you pivot wisely. If you're in your durability, you transform the core. If you are in the vulnerability quadrant, you will scale the new. Let's talk about what each one of these four strategies and tactics mean. Viability, growing the core. That means that you may be in an industry where you have new or reborn industries that are just basically being reinvented, a lot of transformation. This includes telco companies and media companies because now the AT&Ts of the world, the Verizons of the world, they've been going through this for the last 15, 20 years. And it means that sources of com competitive advantage are often short-lived, meaning you have to continue looking for your next way to compete and how do you continue to m keep the goalpost moving because everybody is trying to chase each other, yourself, your competitors, and even your disruptors. So companies in this period or in this particular sector need to embrace actions that keep them in a constant state of innovation. You need to continue to not just 
optimize your offering, but also do a lot of exploration. And this goes into the same discussion that we did about a month ago, saying that today, if you're in a disrupting environment, if you only focus on optimization or exploration, you're gonna end up losing. What this is saying is you need to start doing both. Innovation, you gotta optimize your current offering where your core is, and then you wanna grow it and grow it through new products, new technologies that you're embedding into your offering and solving problems in a different way. Here's an example. Amazon, largest retailer, purchasing, acquiring Whole Foods last year for $13.7 billion. This has now caused ripples across all the grocery stores. And, there, and now everybody's trying to figure out how to leapfrog or how to catch up to what Amazon is doing because all the retailers or the grocery stores are at risk if they don't have a digital strategy. And if they don't take a fi figure out how to uh, take an offensive position, they're gonna be going out of business. Durability, transforming the core. This means that you are in an, in, in an industry where there's a lot of eff efficient and you're in an efficient and very mature industry, but that means that in, if you're in this quadrant, you need to proactively transform your core business in a way that focuses on preserving it. In other words, if you're a generalist, a conglomerate like GE, you may just wanna be focused and go deeper and become not a generalist, but of a specialist, a specialist in within a specific industry. And that means that you have to find your industrial niche, some segment where you have the greatest strength and you maintain it and you grow it and you protect it. Here's an example, Audi, an automaker, and revolutionizing their manufacturing plants in order to produce and scale and then be able to reduce operational costs through automation, through information that they're collecting through data science and artificial intelligence, and then ensuring that automation and technology is embedded into their new manufacturing environments of the future and they're saving billions of dollars by doing this. Vulnerability, scale the new. This means incumbents benefit from continued presence of high barriers of entry. But often, those barriers of entry may not necessarily be there all the time, and as, I, sometimes they may actually, you know, uh, actually disruptors may end up a, a, a good getting through, especially when the barriers may be capital. Well, capital is not a problem when interest rates are low. This is an example of what happened to the airline industry, for example, uh, in the last 15 years, especially post Great Recession. So companies, when they're in this quadrant, need to attend to structural productivity challenges that are part of their core business. And banking is no exception because they're in this vulnerability sector. So here's what an example of an Australian bank, what they have done. <clears throat> they actually have introduced their own wearable payment device which is actually not a, the actual device, it's a, it's a wristband that they're using that has an embedded RFID and a chip that they can use for payment purposes that is all supported by the bank. And what they've done is they actually have created an ecosystem so that third-party application developers can bring in and start developing new applications to actually start buying different things available in the Australian market. And the result is that now they're attracting a lot of third-party app, uh, app developers, very similar to what Apple did with iTunes and their, and their Apple Store. That's what uh, these, uh, Westpac uh, is doing uh, in, in the, in the uh, banking industry in Australia. And they're not the only ones. Capital One is doing something similar here in, in North America. Volatility, pivot wisely. If you're in this quadrant, an industry that has strong barriers to entry, but they over time have eroded because of changing regulatory things that you don't control, market forces you don't control, political, socioeconomic things that have changed, and now those strong barriers that used to be there are eroding. And what that means is that you now need to abandon the core and start looking to you know, figure out where exactly should you go next. And here's an example, Maersk, 
a Danish conglomerate has now separated their lines of business and they now have decided that they're going to start spinning off their oil and gas business unit that has exploration, production, drilling equipment that they're selling into, and they're actually getting ready to start selling it off. As a matter of fact, so far, they've already disposed of one uh, of, of an oil producer and oil transportation, and they have created $7.5 billion of cash that now they can use to reinvest into wherever they're going to be going next for the future. Having $7.5 billion is a great way to actually make sure that your company can still move forward even if there's a lot of disruption in whatever business line or industry you decide to continue moving, uh, moving forward in the future. So this allows them to start investing and start uh, operating and, and increasing their performance and then growing whatever core businesses they want to be in. And that one of the businesses that they want to keep is their logistics business. So bottom line is these core things, these four different tactics, it all really means that with disruption, you must look for ways to transform your business. It means that your offering is not static and even the way the revenue streams attached to your products must change over time. And you need to figure out how do you do it? How do you maintain your revenue and your profitability for your product through different revenue streams, through cost reduction, and then looking for opportunities to reduce operational cost involved in designing, in testing, in manufacturing, distributing, delivering, packaging, supporting products that, are, that you own as a product manager or product marketing manager. So disruption means that you have to look for Continuous change, transforming your product, your business model has to change as well. So before we get further, I want to kind of figure out which industry is most likely to be disrupted. And I also want to take a poll and say which, one, which ones you believe are the ones that are most likely to be disrupted in 2018. All of these industries are already undergoing disruption today. And if you take a look at literature that's out there, if you uh, are looking for which industries are, are most likely to be disrupted in the next few years, these are all the top five industries that are listed no matter what, what source or what reference you're actually looking at. So let's summarize. We went over the seven reasons why product management and product marketing must change. And we talked about all of these and the reasons, you know, what Bain is saying or what other experts are saying that must happen within the role of product management and product marketing. The must change in order to enable product managers and product marketing managers to deal with disruption. We talked about the five global forces that are colliding, causing long-term disruption in the next for the next few decades. A level of disruption that we have never seen before for the last, last 60 years. So enabling your product managers and your product teams to figure out how to recognize it, identify it, and then be able to figure out what are the right tactics to defend and actually go into an offensive to in ensure that disruptors don't win, that you continue to innovate and transform your offering and your business model in order to outperform competitors and remain profitable and hopefully also figure out ways that you can continue to grow the business. How, do you, how, how, do, how are we supposed to be achieving smarter outcomes? I mentioned that smarter means that not only do you have to be smart about what you do, what you don't do when it comes to products that you're managing. The ER is very important because disruption means that you have to continue to change. Often, you don't know whether the changes that you have dis discussed or that you have thought about whether they're gonna take or not. Often you need to figure out very quickly, how are you going to evaluate whether or not you're going in the right direction? And when and how to readjust when you must readjust your course of action. These are all things that are you know, done at the business level, at the product portfolio level, down to individual products that you are managing. And then figure out exactly what an offensive tactic means within your industry. So restructuring the role is key because 
product marketing managers and product managers must be problem solvers. Understand the needs, understand who has those needs, the size of the market, and then figure out not only just come up with a solution, you figure out which solution they see the most value when you can have multiple ways that you can solve the same problem. You pick the solution that's going to get you the majority of the segments that you know are out there. And you need to do a lot of testing, market testing, concept evaluation, and testing before you even move towards designing a preferred solution. And often, you don't get to do this if you're already being told, do this, or you're the product owner, and all you're doing is working on the next sprint with your development team, not necessarily being guided by any information that is coming to you because it does take work to figure out what and how to evaluate and when to readjust. So I wanna get kind of get your perspective in this fourth poll is about how should you restructure the roles? Based on the seven things that we talked about earlier as the reasons why the roles of product management and product marketing, what I'm saying must be restructured what is the best approach to restructure them? How can we restructure the roles? All the literature that I've seen out there, all of these five factors are part of restructuring the roles of product managers and product marketing managers because these are all musts that in today's world, most product managers are just not involved. And most companies today don't have a position that is of the highest authority in product management that is also part of the C-suite with a budget. And the, we're finding out that the winners are already implementing roles like chief product officer and also become like the VP of product or the, the chief of product within the company. Owns all the product offerings and the portfolios even when you have a larger conglomerate. So to wrap up, I really think that the restructuring is all about enabling product leaders within your company to be bold, to make the hard decisions about what to do and what not to do based on the level of disruption that you're observing within your industry and for your business and your market. And it's also about enabling all the product managers and product marketing managers within an organization to ensure that you're not only just observing that you're actively looking for ways to undo and to disrupt your competitors and disrupt the smaller companies that are trying to come in, figure out how to quickly eliminate the impact of lots of disruptors coming in to your market and your industry. So that's a summary of, of, of today's discussion. And before we can get into q and I actually wanna say there's actually, I've been posting all my most popular talks and uh, webcasts that I've done, and you can actually go to this particular landing page for a sample, and you can actually view any content that I've done in the last three years. This is all the content that I've done that I've been able to capture and share with you. Also, if you're interested and you need help in figuring out how to achieve smarter product outcomes within your company, how to enable product leaders within your organization to actually become much better at making the right decisions at the right time and enabling everybody to ensure that they understand why it's important to move and why you need to reprioritize things, reach out to me, set up a free call. You can actually use the link here to just set up a time when we can chat, talk about your business situation, and maybe identify ways that I can help you. And if I can help you, I will at least point you in the right direction to where somebody that will be able to help you. Yeah, what I wanna do is I wanna say, that I wanna thank all of you for being here. And as I mentioned, reach out to me. And Chris, thank you very much for, for being a great host and um, look forward to being here next time.